So we're going to Jonah, chapter number one, and um, if you don't have your hard copy or a device wherein you can follow me uh, reading the scripture, we're going to make sure it's on the screen so that you can follow me. But I want you to, to take good notes and, and don't close your hearts, amen? Father, we bless you in this house for who you are. We're grateful that you demonstrated your love towards us and that while we were yet sinning, Christ died for us. We thank you for the wonderful privilege you have extended to us to break through the veil of the flesh and to enter into the holiest of holies. And there, God, we bow before you. We thank you that access once denied is today access granted. And so, Father, as we assemble ourselves together in this place, those who are streaming in, those in person, God, we thank you that you arrest our attention, that you circumcise our ears to hear, you open our eyes so that we see, cultivate the ground of our hearts so that your word will take root, and Satan and his demons will have no occasion, no opportunity to steal the word sown. We thank you, Father, that we have a willingness to unlearn some things that we have been exposed to, things that we've been taught, so that we can learn the way you have instructed. We thank you that you have given us your word, Father, and we thank you for a correct interpretation of your word, rightly divided your word. Challenge us on today, convict us of sin, convince us of truth, and as only you can do, Father, change us. And remind us that the greatest miracle walking planet Earth is a transformed life. God, we give you our undivided attention as you speak to our hearts. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're at Jonah chapter number 1, verses 1 through 17. And I'm going to read through all of uh, these verses so that there is clarity as it pertains to what's actually happening at this particular time in biblical history. The Lord gave this message to Jonah. Jonah's name, Hebrew name, it, it means dove. He is the son of Amittai. His father's name means truth. God's word to Jonah, verse number two, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh happens to be the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. Now, Jonah has issue with God's instructions. Verse number three, but Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. I want us to understand that Jonah was not a coward. He was a Hebrew prophet, and he was well able to take this message to Nineveh. But Jonah had serious issues with the Assyrians. Because of their cruel treatment of his people, he actually hated the Assyrians. And instead of God showing them mercy and giving them an opportunity to repent, Jonah wanted vengeance. Verse 3, but Jonah got up, he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. And where could he possibly go? This is actually a, a, a picture of us in a state of sin because when we don't want to obey God, we go in the opposite direction. And we can be fully aware of what God requires of us because uh, uh, God has made it known to us, but because we don't want to do what God instructed us to do, we're going the opposite direction. Jonah has it in his mind to get away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. I want us to understand today that none of us can ever get away from the presence of God. Verse 4, but the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Who sent this storm? Who sent the storm? Come on, talk to me. Who sent the storm? So Satan did not send this storm. 
Many times when we're going through trouble, we're going through agony, we're going through a hard place, we're quick to say the devil is doing it. I submit to us that God is going to make it very clear to us that there are some of the storms we're facing, he sent the storm. So the scripture says, verse number five, fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. So they're in fear for their lives, not because of something that they did. I just wonder how many of us are in jeopardy because we're in relationships with people who have angered God. Just pay attention. So they began to throw over the cargo to lighten the ship, but all this time Jonah was sound asleep down in the hole. Now, he, he, he thinks that he is hidden from God. He is running from God, but God's really going to prove to him who the greater one is. So the, the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted, get up and pray to your God. Everybody else is praying to their God. You pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. <laughs> it is important which God you're praying to. <laughs> Verse 7, then the crew cast lots. They're superstitious, and, and God is going to intervene and, and show them the reality of his power. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded, who are you? What is your line of work? What's your occupation? What country are you from? What's your nationality? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew. Pay attention. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. Uh, he is known as El Hashemim, the God of the heavens. Elohim, Bahasha Amin. The God of the heavens, I worship this God. Listen, he's the one who made the sea and the land. He controls it all. Verse 10, the sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why'd you do it? <laughs> they groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, Wait a minute, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Just one person causing a storm. They've thrown over the cargo, and they're asking now, what do we do with you? And what is it, who is it that we refuse to let go of who brought us into a stormy place, but we're still trying to hold on to them? Who is that individual? Who is she? Who is he that you refuse to let go, yet you're experiencing a storm and can't nobody stop this storm but God? So Jonah says, and he's not a coward. He says, throw me into the sea. Jonah said, notice he says, now once you get rid of me, once you throw me overboard, since I'm really the cause of this and God is really after me, it will become calm. The sea will become calm again. I know that, pay attention, this terrible storm is all my fault. And are we mature enough, honest enough to say that I've attracted some storms into my life? This storm is really my fault. Verse 13, instead the sailors, <laughs> wait a minute now, they don't want to throw him overboard. He's the problem. He's the culprit. He says, I am the one who's responsible for the storm. And they decide they're going to try to row even harder to get the ship to land. You see, absolutely nothing we do will gain us any ground when God is positioned against us. But the stormy sea was too violent for them. And they couldn't make it. Can you, can you all see it? Verse 14, then they cried out to the Lord. <laughs> the Lord, Jonah's God. Now they're talking to the right God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die. Pay attention. Don't make us die for this man's sin. I don't hold, listen, and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent this storm upon him. For your own good reasons. We ain't arguing with you. We ain't got no problem with you. 
We just want a way out of this. Verse 15, then the sailors picked Jonah up. Forget all this rowing, trying to move harder, trying to get to shore, trying to spare this man's life. There's a force greater against us. The sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. I wonder if we just make the shift, and we just get rid of some folk if the storm would stop. I wonder if we just make the shift if we're attentive to God enough to see this ain't working. The sailors were all struck by the Lord's great power and they offered him a sacrifice. They had even been worshiping God and vowed to serve him. We're coming over to your side. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. To complement our teaching series, Firefighters, let's just ask the question, who sent this storm? The Bible really is filled with real people, just like you and just like me. Real life experiences, real issues, just like you and just like me. Because we live on planet Earth, a fallen world, a sin-sick world, all of us will face storms, every breathing one of us. There are storms we will all face in life that transcend atmospheric conditions, weather conditions. There, there are storms that we experience. They're relational storms. It has to do with marriage, and, and, and in some instances, it, it has to do with friendships or business partners or parenting. They're relational storms, and we must contend with them. There are financial storms, unemployment, layoffs, mismanagement of funds, unwise stewardship, financial storms, the signs of the times. There are emotional storms, emotional whirlwinds, mental whirlwinds, and we have to contend with these storms. There are physical storms, storms that have to do with our health, sickness, disease, accidents, fires, and then, of course, there are spiritual storms. Whatever the storm, pay attention, there will always be a spiritual root. Storms have an interesting way of exposing who we really are and what we really believe. I want to repeat that. Storms. They have an interesting way of exposing who we really are and what we truly believe. And if growth is ever to occur for any of us, growth occurs in the hard places. It's, it's not on the mountaintop. It, it's not during times of ease. Growth happens in the hard places. A key statement, our attitude in the storm will always determine the outcome of the storm. It's my attitude when I'm facing the storm. Proverbs 24.10 says, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. In each one of us, we face storms based upon our mental conditioning. The internal state of us dictates how we face a storm. There are some people who are very strong, very courageous, very tenacious, very dogmatic about overcoming and prevailing in the face of a storm. And then there are those who are wimpy, mousy, whining, crying, complaining. And that won't get you out of a storm. I've learned a whole lot from nature, much like my son. There, there are some creatures that I, I truly admire the strength of. Observation number one, the lion is not the tallest. The lion is not the smartest. The lion is not the fastest. It's, it's not the strongest or heaviest beast of the field, yet he eats the smartest. <laughs> He consumes the fastest, he overtakes the strongest, the heaviest, and he takes down the tallest. Why? It is his mentality. It is his attitude. He sees himself, come to class today, he sees himself inferior to nothing and no one. He's not a coward. He sees himself like he carries himself, and thus other creatures see him as the king he sees himself to be. How do you see yourself? You see, we behave in life based upon how we see ourselves. Not only that, but we treat others based upon how we see them. Our mental conditioning is essential when we face storms. Our point of emphasis, did you write it down? How we see ourselves in the storm is critical to our ability to prevail in the storm. How I see myself. You see, if I see myself less than, 
not good enough. Listen, I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not cute enough. I'm not fine enough. I just don't have what the other person has. Listen, if I see myself less than, then I behave less than. And I will surely project my weaknesses on to those who really know who they are. It is important how you see yourself. Everybody say, I'm not ugly. I'm not less than. Everybody say, I'm enough. Come on, let's say it loud. I am not ugly. I am not less than. I am enough. Why is that the case? Because God created us. He created us in his image, and he created us after his likeness. Observation number two, it is the eagle. My office is filled with portraits, statues, the eagle, majestic bird. Just as God prepares his children, pay attention, for the storm before the storm. No storm we face did God not prepare us first. Before the storm, before the crisis, before the challenge, God always prepares us. Before the season of testing, he has prepared us. He has warned us. He sent us a word, but much like Jonah, we didn't really like the word that he sent. We didn't really care for those instructions. The eagle. This eagle knows when a storm is approaching long before the storm. It's important our perspective, our perception, our mental conditioning. He sees, and eagles are not afraid of storms. The eagle will fly to some high place and wait with anticipation for the winds to come. I'm waiting on it. You see, I've been wired for this, prepared for this. And it's going to be a benefit to me. When the storm hits, the eagle sets its wings so that the wind from the storm will catapult it up and lift it above the storm. God has given the eagle this ability, and from creation we learn something really powerful. Storms are not to be feared. We should learn from that storm. We want to know, why am I in this storm? How did I end up in this storm? How do I get out of this storm? What's the benefit of the storm? We all face seasons. Pay attention. We will all face, face seasons of storms. And some of you may say, oh, you know, my life is easy. My life is good. I got it going on. Just keep living and keep breathing. You see, seasons do change. Did we come to class today? It's important that, that we recognize that there are seasons of storms and we have a very powerful example as to how to navigate our storms. And I don't know about you all, I only have time to deal with my storms. It's a given. I don't have time to mess around with you when you're in a storm, and I'm not going to find myself subject to the winds, the waves, listen, the rage of your storm because I'm in close proximity with you. <laughs> Y'all missed that part. This is where we really do take a close look at relationships. You see, I should not be going through a storm because you attracted the judgment of God or you attracted this storm. I'm only going through the storms, listen, that I have to deal with. I got grace for my storms, not yours. You all missed that. When we cannot see how we will make it through, we always trust God who sees. God sees everything. Jonah thinks he's hiding. Everybody say, God sees everything. God sees everything. Jonah is running. Everybody say, God sees, God sees everything. He is sleeping down in the hole. God sees everything. The Bible says his all-seeing eye is in every place, beholding the evil and the good. I trust the God who sees everything. While the storm rages below, listen, the eagle is soaring above the storm. In a low place, pay attention, we are limited. That's why low thinking is dangerous. To see higher, we must be willing to go higher. It speaks to our growth and our development. It speaks to our refusal to remain stuck and stagnant and average and marginal and nominal and mediocre. I refuse to be average. We must think higher and God's created us so that we see higher. The eagle does not escape the storm, pay attention. 
but he uses the winds that bring the storm. He actually uses the storm for his benefit to lift, lift him higher than the storm. And you and I should be using these storms. What am I to learn from this? I want to use this storm as a launching pad to catapult me into a place that is far greater than where I've been. Eagles don't even try to escape storms. They use them. So when we face storms, not if, but when we face storms, when we face them, like the eagle, we can prepare ourselves to take full advantage of the storms by rising above them on the wings of God's grace. What did you learn from that storm? The question today is, who sent the storm? Perhaps you are in a storm today and you're, you're unsure who sent it. I'm going to help us out today. Many of us, like Jonah, know why we're in a storm. We know why we're in it and we know who sent it. So sometimes we're in a storm because of our own rebellion against God. I attracted this. God's got my attention. I'm in this place right now because of something that God has instructed me to do that I just refuse to do. Something that I don't want to give up. I don't want to let go. I'm angry with somebody. I'm bitter. I'm resentful. Jonah was just downright angry. He wanted God's vengeance upon the enemy. He did not want God to show mercy. And God forbid we're in that place where we're holding bitterness in our hearts against somebody. We're, we're unforgiving towards somebody. Look, look at what they did to me. And God is fully aware. And God is still compassionate. There's a name that Jonah becomes very intimately acquainted with. It is El Shanun. He is the God who's gracious. He's the God of mercy. Sometimes we're in a storm because of an assault of Satan. And our faith is on trial. Such is the case with Job. You see, so the sons of God present themselves before God. And, and Satan is in the midst. And Satan wants, he wants the opportunity to get at Job. This is the correct interpretation. So you've been checking out my servant, Job. He's a perfect and he's an upright man. He avoids evil and you've been checking him out. You want to test him. You want to try him. And then God gives the devil permission. Sometimes we're in a storm because we can be trusted with the storm. Sometimes and some of you, I don't want that kind of storm. Right? So Job, Job being a great man, he loses everything. How would you like to have 10 children and in one day all your children are dead? He had to do 10 funerals at one time. A storm because of a, a, a satanic assault and my faith is on trial here. And what Satan thought that Job would do, he never did. The Bible says that Job maintained his integrity and he worshipped God. You still in class? We're identifying these storms. Sometimes we're in a storm because of the choice of, so choices of others. Jonah made a choice. So you brought me into a storm, and I'm not going to stay in this storm. The best way to get out of this storm is to get rid of you. Yeah. Some of y'all don't want to do it, right? But God's already given you a word, right? He's already given you a word that she's not good for you. She's toxic. He's not good for you. He's toxic. And understand, any relationship that does not draw me closer and closer to God is not of God. You know, I don't believe that. You, you ain't got to have nobody just bringing you close to God. Here's the deal. If you're not bringing me closer and closer and closer to God, you're taking me further and further and further away from God. It's, it, it's much like our lead pastor last week when he shared with us or in one of the teaching series that friends know who to take you to. Friends don't take you to the hookah bar. Friends not taking you to the pit house, the whore house. Friends are not taking you bar hopping. Uh-oh, see, you're going to get quiet on me now. <laughs> Friends are not going to take me into a place that would cause me to reap the judgment of God. Yeah. So I had a brother who was older than me, and uh, his, his, his best friend, so-called best friend, turned him on the weed. So he starts smoking weed, but it es escalates. It, it doesn't stay there with the weed. Then he's into the crack scene. He's into the cocaine scene, and he keeps using, and he keeps using, and he keeps using until one day we get a phone call. He's in intensive care at, at the hospital. By the time we get there, he's already brain dead. He's in his 20s. His friend started the cycle now. His friend didn't make him do it, but his friend introduced him to the drugs that escalated from one degree to the next. 
And so he, he dies there in the hospital and we get the autopsy report and it is acute toxic cocaine poisoning. But his friend turned him on. What is your friend turning you on to? That you're yet enjoying, but it has is, it is brought a storm into your life. Sometimes we're in a storm because of the choices of others. The apostle Paul was in a storm in Acts 27. He had given them the admonishment, given them the warning not to take this trip, but they take it anyway. And in the, the midst of, of this, particular, this, this particular sailing, now we have a huge storm. And he says, sirs, you should have listened to me and not taken the voyage. Sometimes we're in a storm because of the choices of others. Sometimes we're in a storm because of a God-given assignment. The disciples, Mark chapter 4. Jesus said, listen, Jesus said, he spoke the word, let us go to the other side. They get in a ship, they're headed to the other side, and while on their way, Jesus falls asleep. Now, I said Jesus fell asleep, not the Christ. Y'all miss, because God doesn't sleep, he doesn't need sleep, he doesn't slumber. Jesus, you see. The human side, he was asleep and there's a storm raging and now the disciples are panicking. They're all upset. Jesus has already said we're going to the other side. And so they begin to shake him and wake him up. Don't you care? It is important who you're in the storm with. Jesus, don't you care that we perish? And, and he gets up and he rebukes the wind. He rebukes the waves. Can y'all see it? And then he turns to his disciples and he says, how is it that you have no faith? Can you see it? So, but notice, they get to the other side. And then when they get to the other side, there is the demoniac of Gadara. There was an assignment on the other side. Who sent that storm? So Satan never wants us to fulfill a God-given assignment. And he'll do everything he can to distract us, to hold us back. Sometimes we're in a storm because of a divine plan beyond. Beyond us. Engineered and orchestrated by God. So just Joseph hated by his brothers and separated from his father and thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. And then Potiphar's wife, she, she has her eye on him because he's good looking, he's real fine. And, you know, we're not going to use the word, no, she wanted to know him. No, she wanted to have sex with him. Pay attention. She wanted to have sex with him. Young man, she's a married woman. You know girls are like that today. <laughs> I don't like this sermon. So... So now, because he would not take her upon her offer, she accuses him of raping her. He's thrown into prison, right? A dungeon. And, and while he's there, he's given the ability to interpret dreams, but, but somehow he's forgotten and left in prison. But when God said it's time, that's when God brought him out. Sometimes we're in a storm because of a divine plan that is engineered and orchestrated by God. Storms. Some storms bring us to a place of repentance. Where God wants us to recognize that I'm in the wrong place, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing, and it's time for me to turn around. Jonah turned away from God instead of turning to God because of his own bitterness, his own unforgiveness, his own hatred towards the Assyrians. Storms designed to bring repentance and obedience. Some storms reveal the danger of relationships we're in. Do you know out of all of the areas we're in, we discuss issues. It's the number one area is relationships. The number one area is relationships. And I keep uh, reiterating this. What are you holding on to that you don't want to let go of? You know it's killing you. It's stealing your peace. It steals your joy. Listen, you don't study. You don't pray. You don't fast. You don't want to be in church, right? Why do you want to hold on to that? Oh, I must be in the right place because y'all are real quiet. You know, this, this is why I want to hold on to it because it made me feel good. Even though it's killing you. It makes me feel like somebody. Even though it's killing you. Even though your hair is falling out. Some of you would be glad about this. Even though it's causing you to lose weight. <laughs> oh, please help me. Why? When God shows us this thing is not good for you. Anybody willing to let it go? Yeah. Let it go? No, because we, 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 we needed it on Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'm, I'm, let me stop messing with you. I'm stop messing with you. 
Some storms reveal the danger of relationships we are in. You see, that relationship should cause me to love God and want God and spend time with God. Can't get enough of God. Reading the word of God and fasting and praying, worshiping. Listen, that relationship should bring me in closer. Some storms develop and mature us for greater usefulness in the kingdom of God. Joseph or Daniel or Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. Storms, some of those storms, they expose the weaknesses in us, the cracks in us, the depth of our character or the lack thereof. King David, who sleeps with another man's wife, Bathsheba, and then has her husband murdered, trying to cover it up. Everybody say, God sees everything. Some storms purify us and keep us from a fall, such as Paul and the thorn in his flesh, right, to keep him from a fall. Some storms are preparation for a God-ordained assignment. So let's talk about it. It's unfortunate that many of us are consumed with this positive aspect of preaching. Every sermon has to be positive. It has to be motivational. It has to be encouraging. And we fail to realize that every day does not present positive circumstances. Let's learn something. Every day does not present to us positive circumstances. Some days are truly difficult, and the only reason we're able to endure the hardness of the day is because of God's grace. God's word correctly interpreted and taught challenges us, pay attention, to mature. Everybody say, it's time for me to grow up. God's word challenges us when it is rightly divided, when it is correctly taught. It ain't no money coming, nothing. It ain't no I'm slain in the spirit. It's not no slobbering, passing out, and somebody can see all your undergarments. Listen, jerking and gyrating and running and screaming. It is maturity. It is growing up. Everybody say, grow up. up. God's word correctly interpreted and taught challenges us to mature, to grow up, to stand higher, and to totally surrender to Christ so that the culture will be drawn to the Christ in us. You see, the culture should not be shaping us. The culture should not be dictating our choices. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. We want the word, right? Let's take a look at it. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And this was the most corrupt church of all the churches that he established. He says, now, we work hard to persuade others. We're persuading them towards Christ. God knows we are sincere. And I hope you know this, too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No. We're giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry. What we do over in our church, rather than pay attention, having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, if it is for your benefit. What we do, whether it's lead pastor, leaders in the church, elder, senior pastor, what are we doing? We're doing it for your benefit. Not to rape, bleed, or fleece, or take the unfair advantage of. Not to exploit, or to defraud, or to masquerade. But it's for your benefit. Can you all see it? And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to, listen, that old life. Everybody say, I've died to that old life. Come on, let's, let's, let's engage the teaching. I've died to the hookah bar. Come on. Die, 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 die. Oh, see, that was too soft. That was too soft. Come on. I died to the hookah bar. Come on. Die. Oh, I, I, I died to bar hopping. Come on. I died to shacking. <laughs> To sleeping around. around. Let's make it clear. Fornicating. Come on. I died to fornicate. I died to fornicate. I died to lying. Come on. I, I died to all of that, that Beyonce stuff. I died to all of that. <laughs> oh, I died to that. I gave it up when I said yes to Jesus. I gave it up. We ain't faking it till we make it. Listen, we're living this and we're authentic and we're credible. I gave it up. All the lying and the conniving and the cheating and the, the, the stealing and the sipping and the dipping. <laughs> I, I gave it up. 
for this new life. I'm talking those who want God. And you made a decision. I'm not trying to play both sides of it. You see, that's not even possible. Because with God, there are no gray areas here. I'm on the side of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, or I'm on the side of the kingdom of darkness, the devil and his demons. Listen, we can't play both sides. He died. Now, I, I, I've given up this other life, right? What verse? Did y'all stop? Y'all kept reading with me? What verse are we at? 15. How many are you, are you sure? I want to go back to 14. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to the, that old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live uh -oh, for themselves. Instead, they will live for who? Christ. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, a new creature, a new creation. Can you see it? The old life is gone. Now, maybe I didn't call your old thing. Y'all want to help me call out some old things? What, what are some old things? Some old things. Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Oh, fornication, we said that, we said that. Somebody else? What is it? I don't know what that is. Okay, vaping, fornicating, drinking, cussing. Somebody said cussing. Okay, well, what else is there? Shacking, we said shacking. Where were you, right? We already dealt with that. Okay, I can't understand some of y'all. What, 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 what about porn? What about porn? Oh, somebody said, ooh! <laughs> Pornography, right? Should it be addressed? Absolutely. Because we died to that stuff. And now we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Some of that stuff y'all yelled out, I don't even know what that was, right? But thank God that's our old life. It's gone. Everybody said, that's gone. That's gone. That's gone. Now, we, we have this new life in Christ. And all of us, this is a gift. Understand this from God who brought us back to himself. Remember, Jonah was running away from God, but he had to turn around and get back, and, and that fish helped him get back. Who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task. Pay attention. Why does God want me saved? Because he wants to use me to get others saved. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him, bringing people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. So listen, God ain't angry with you. Devil ain't got nothing on you. Listen, you're not rehearsing the sins of your past. Everybody has a past. We're all flawed. We've all messed up. And now today we're new creatures in Christ. Can we see it? So the scripture says, and he has given us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So who are we today? We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Everybody say, come back to God. But God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So is it possible, Lord have mercy, that the Christian church has preached so much sugar and milk messages that we have, listen, we have contributed to the lack of spiritual growth in God's church. So is it any wonder that we have any number of things going on in God's church because we got jelly-back preachers, coward preachers, who are afraid to tell the truth? Why? We don't want to offend nobody. We want to keep the crowds coming. We don't want people to leave. We don't want people to unfollow us or say something negative about us. Is it possible that the Christian church has preached so much sugar Milk messages, watered down messages that we have contributed to the lack of spiritual growth in God's church. No wonder folk are so weak they can't stand when they face trouble. <laughs> Consider, what are we teaching people? Can the professed follower of Christ mature and stand in the face of storms in such a dark and a sinister world on what we preach? 
Too often, pay attention, I'm giving you a key statement, we prefer teachings that promote good feelings and encouragement, failing to realize that these teachings do not position us, they don't prepare us mentally or spiritually for the storms of life, and the storms are coming to all of us. Amen. The truth of the matter is that many times in an effort to keep people from being offended or just to keep folk comfortable in their sins, we are not told the truth. Listen, when Jesus is present in the church and when the Holy Spirit is moving in the room, anybody in sin ought to be uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He's the reveal of truth. He is our teacher, and he will convict us of sin. Now, in this room with this many people in all the overflow areas, could you possibly believe that we are not in some area of our lives doing something that offends God? And the Holy Spirit's job is to make sure we are uncomfortable. So that we repent. Your key statement, non-offensive, diluted, non-threatening sermons will always produce dwarf-like characteristics retarding growth and development. <laughs> non-offensive. I won't fear nobody. I don't want to get nobody upset. Jesus kept folk upset. The embodiments of God himself, God pre-incarnate, he kept folk upset. Why? He told them the truth. And those who wanted to change, they held on to him. And those who did not want to change, right, they made sure they cried real loud, crucify him. Didn't want him. Non-offensive, diluted, non-threatening sermons will always produce <laughs> dwarf-like characteristics, retarding growth and development. I heard somebody say, can you please bring your son back? <laughs> we want our lead pastor. We quickly applaud, pay attention, we quickly applaud watered down, sugar-coated, non-threatening, non-offensive sermon. That's what we want to hear because I want to feel good. And far too many of those sermons preached undermine the power of the established standard that God has given his church. So God has given us the principle. He's given us that standard, the code of conduct. He's given us the manual for Christian living. He says, this is the way, walk therein. That's what God has given us. He's given us the principle. Everybody say that's the code of conduct. You don't have church without the Bible. You don't have church without the word of God. We need the standard, the code of conduct. And everybody is expected to come up higher. You may not be there yet, but you should be on your way. Now you need to tell somebody, I'm on my way. Tell them I'm on my way. I'm on my way. <laughs> I'm on my way. Some of y'all sitting there, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I am on my way. I am not there yet, but I am on my way. I refuse to be stuck. God gave us the pattern. That's the model that he wants us to imitate. You all remember this? And say it uh, right after I say it. I want you all to say it. The greatest miracle is a transformed life. Let's say it again. One more time. That's what God's after. A transformed life. Doctors can do heart transplants, can't they? Kidney transplant, can't they? They cannot transform the human heart. They cannot transform our lives so that we're in step with God. They cannot transform us to the degree that we obey God. God wants obedience. So our key statement, no amount of motivation in this world can eradicate the reality of storms. No motivation. We will all go through storms. We're going to go through seasons of discomfort, seasons of disappointment, seasons of testings, seasons of disaster. But the truth of the matter is that all of us will share in the storms and God brings us through the storms. They come to the educated and the uneducated, the sinner and the saint, the rich and the poor, right? The high achievers come to all of us. Well, just tell me how to get out of it. I just want to know how to get out of it. Since it's a given, right, we're sure. Key statement, God has his hand on our storms. That's good to know that when I'm in the storm, God is in the storm with me. Even if I'm responsible for the storm. If you think, this is 1 Corinthians 10, if you think you are strong, you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. So don't think you all that. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. So somebody else has gone through that. But God is faithful. Everybody say God is faithful. God is faithful. So he will not allow us to be tempted he won't allow the temptation to be more than we can stand. Can you see it? Yeah. And when we're tempted, he will show us. He'll show us the way out so that we can endure. Storms have the power to equip us and empower us to keep our hope and our confidence in God. 
So let's just go through some points here, and I'm going to close. Are you all all right? Because the rest of this, uh, you all say, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> just a, a few, few considerations. And uh, I'm going to give you all a homework assignment. I just want you all to read Psalm 139, right? So there are times when God will send a storm. How do I get through this storm? You ready? Y'all better talk loud. I'll, 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 I'll leave you right there in that storm. I'll leave you right there. Okay, here we go. Here's the work. Train the mind to be filled with, shaped by, fixed on, and renewed by the Word of God. What do I do? I'm going to train my mind. Now understand this is going to be a discipline because if I'm going to train the mind to really be fixed on God's Word, then I must be guarded as to what I put before the mind. If I want a clean mind, a healthy mind, a strong mind, okay, I'm going to have to get rid of the porn. Come on now. And, and, and all the little nasty music that you're listening to, right? So you, you all know some of the people, right? So you throw out a few names. Throw out a few names. See, everybody quiet because you don't want nobody to know. See, you don't want nobody to know you've been listening, right? So it's filled with filth and, and, and it's seductive, right? It's full of obscene language. Okay, I want to train my mind. So I got to get rid of that music, those movies. Don't train the mind to be filled up with, shaped by, fixed on, and renewed by the Word of God. The only agent that will clean up a filthy mind is the Word of God. And I need to be hearing it over and over and over and over again. Next point, never allow your thoughts or emotions to descend to the level of the storm. Boy, I'm going through this storm, but, but I'm not this. Now, listen, Jonah did not allow his thoughts, his emotions to descend to the level of the storm. He recognized, I'm responsible. I'm at fault. I've been upset with God because I don't want him to show mercy on the Assyrians. But listen, I'm not this. I'm not going to condescend, acquiesce to the level of the storm. I know how to get out of it. Never allow the storm to dictate your behavior. I'm going through it. Whatever it is, it's a relational storm. Can you see it? It's a mental, it's an emotional storm. It's a financial storm. But I'm not going to allow it to dictate my behavior. I know that storms do not define us. They expose us. Come on. Storms expose what's on the inside. And that's a good thing because God wants it front and center. Why? God wants to deal with us. Know the reason for the storm. Did God send the storm because I'm in, in rebellion? I disobeyed God. I dishonored God. I didn't follow his instructions. Did Satan send this storm because God is preparing me for a great assignment? Or because I made a choice? Can you see it? I made a choice that invited this storm into my life. Was it God, Satan, self, or is this someone else's storm? My husband and I, we were trying to help this girl out. And uh, this girl was in a whole lot of trouble. And we were, we got in the way. You know, we can sometimes, particularly parents, grandparents, we can try to play God. Anybody relate to that? You know, you've you lived long enough to have even grandchildren. So we tried to jump in and help. And I, when I tell you there was a backlash, the storm that was on this girl's life hit us real hard. My husband and I got out of there real quick. We left her to her own storm. So there's no reason for me to be in this because, see, I didn't cause this. I didn't bring this upon myself. I was trying to help you. Watch out for people you're trying to help, right? Particularly if God didn't tell you to do it. You have to let them reap the consequences of their own choices, their own actions. Let the storm shake you, shape you, not shake you. We've gone through storm after storm after storm after storm, and I'm telling you, it has shaped us into some powerful vessels for the kingdom. Let it shape you, not shake you. Pray to God and repent of all sin. All right, you brought this into your life because you sinned against God. Okay, God, I repent. Now, listen, prayerfully, you don't have to have a big fish experience. God was well able. He fashioned this fish for Jonah so that it didn't eat him up. <laughs> How does a man, a whole man, live in the belly of a big fish three days? not destroy you. God had his hand on this situation. But God has a big fish for all of us. When we decide I'm not going to do it God's way. You don't want a hog pen experience. You don't want a big fish experience, do you? Some of y'all looking like, look, you scared me now. God knows the right situation and the right circumstance to shake you, to wake you up and cause you to repent. By the time Jonah got out of that fish, he was glad to go preach. Yeah. <laughs> 
Some of us, God, if you just get me out of this storm, God, if you just deliver me, I'll do what you told me. He was glad to go preach. And when he preached, listen, then the Assyrians, they got saved and he got mad. Because he said, I knew this is what was going to happen. That little old bitty sermon he preached caused 120,000 people to repent and turn to God. And I, let me just show you. So in, in chapter number four, it's just four chapters you have to read. In chapter number four, uh, Jonah's sitting around, he's pouting, he's mad, and, and God has a plant to cover him and to protect him. He got a little attitude, you know, he's smelling himself. So God destroys the plant, and he allows a worm to destroy the plant, and Jonah's pissed. God sends a storm, he's upset. And so God says to them, how is it that you could be upset over a plant? Listen, I created it. Everybody understand this, God is in control, he owns it all. How could you be upset over this little worm? How could you be upset about the storm, but you were not upset that 120,000 people were going to die in their sins had they not repented and turned to me? How could you not show compassion? And I'm just asking us today, do you have a heart of compassion where you're born again and, and you want to see other people saved, right? Because that's why we're ambassadors, so that we can make sure others are reconciled to Christ. Is that right? Let's look at the final points. You have them written down? We repent. Everybody say, I repent. I mean, I'm turning away from all that stuff, and I'm going to return to God, and I'm going to stay with God. Your, your next point, trust God and thank God for how he is preparing you for the storm. You see, God prepares us for the storm today. But I don't want no storm. All of us, as long as we're living, we're going to go through storms. Right? But God prepares us for the test before the test. It's like our educators, right? How many of you, you, you've had education, right? You've gone through school. Your educators prepared you for the exam before the exam, right? Even if they just told you to read the book. It was your responsibility to read the book. But we're prepared for the test before the test. And then finally, be compassionate towards others who are going through a storm. Why is that one important? The compassion we extend to others during their storm will dictate the compassion extended to us during our own storm. God is gracious. He forgives. See, God could have just killed Jonah and used somebody else, right? But he wanted to use Jonah. I want you all to pay attention. God wants to use you. He does. He, he know by what I did before you were conceived in your mother's womb. And yet he still has made choice of you. You all look at me real good. God wants to use you. Do you know why you're still breathing? Because God wants you. God has a good plan for your life. And you're, you're filled to the overflowing with so many gifts that you have yet to use for the glory of God. Listen, you all, you really don't have time for the weed. You don't have time for the hookah or the vaping or the, or the porn or the secular concerts. You don't have time for that. You were created for God. I said you were created for Him. He created you in His image and after His likeness. And God forbid that you would waste time messing off your life with foolishness. You see, you want to be ready. Whenever the storm comes, you want to be ready. And what guarantees that we will prevail? It is God's grace, because it is important who's with me in that storm. You want God on your side. Stand on your feet. You don't want God against you. Some of you are, I said, man, you know, there's a lot of conviction, you know. You know, I still got my girl. I'm still doing my thing, you know. I can't afford for that girl to kick me out right now. And lady, you see, you don't feel good about you, so you feel like you need him to validate you. And it's not him that you need. But you see, God's not going to break down the door of your heart to make you want him. He wants you to want him. 
And you see, everything else in your life, everything else in your life, you see, that'll work for you if you'll just return to Him. Can you see it? Everybody say, God has a good plan for my life. Come on, say it loud. And I know I've said it many times. He knows the worst about me, but He still made choice of me. I'm ready. God, to return to you, to obey you, to carry out your assignment. See, it may not be 120,000 people like Jonah. Is that Victor? Yeah, it could just be one. It's just one. Just one. And don't you discount the importance of the one that only you can touch. You can touch people that I'll never be able to touch. A lead pastor will never be able to touch, but God will use you to touch them. But are you willing to rearrange your life? to accommodate the kingdom agenda. Remember, not your agenda, because you're called an ambassador, his ambassador. And we're here, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to represent him, not the devil. How could we want to represent someone as sick as Satan, carrying out his sick agenda? No, that's not why we're here. We're here to carry out God's may come across very convicting, but that's what conviction does. It sets us up for change, because God wants you. Amen? Come on, let's thank God for his word, everybody.